Hi, everybody. Welcome to the webinar on building OER sustainability on your campus. We are really pleased today to have Dr. Lisa Young from the Maricopa Community College District, Scottsdale Community College, and James Glapa-Grossklag from the College of the Canyons in California joining us today to tell us about their approaches to OER sustainability. For uh, those of you who are used to hearing Una Daly's lovely voice, you'll notice that I am not Una. I am Mary Lou Forward. I'm moderating today because Una is not able to be with us. Um, I wanted to go over quickly the agenda. We're going to start with the introductions of the speakers, and if you would like to introduce yourself, please do so in the chat window. We're going to give a quick overview of CCCOER, talk about the College of the Canyons and their approaches to sustainability, talk about the Maricopa Community College District and their approaches, uh, well, then we're going to have a discussion, which we hope you will be uh, quite active in participation, uh, sending us your questions and engaging in that conversation. We'll give you a little bit more information about how you can stay up to date on what's happening and then close with any questions you might have. So I wanted to introduce first the presenters. As I mentioned before, we have Dr. Lisa Young. She's the faculty director for the Center for Teaching and Learning at Scottsdale Community College. And we have James Glapagroskleid, who's the Dean of Educational Technology, Learning Resources, and Distance Education for College of the Canyons in Southern California. So very quickly, for those of you who are not familiar with CCCOER, uh, the mission of CCCOER is really to expand awareness and access to high quality open educational resources for community colleges. And in doing that, they support faculty choice and development and improve student success through using OER and implementing open education projects and resources. CCC's OER reach is across the United States and Canada with about 250 colleges and districts represented on listservs and in its activities. Now we're going to move into the theme of today's webinar, which is sustainability. And the themes that you're going to hear coming out today are people, when they're thinking about um, sustainability, they're thinking about faculty engagement, how students get involved, what's the level of institutional commitment, and how do you increase that? And then, of course, the question on everyone's mind is funding. So I want to start off with James glapa Grossclad from College of the Canyons, who's going to give us the first presentation. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Mary Lou. And I just wonder if we could uh, advance the slides along. I may be I'm not seeing that on my end. Oh. Wonderful. You Thank you enough? so much. Sorry about that, everybody. No worries. Una Daly makes it look so easy, doesn't she? She's uh, putting together the slides, talking, chewing gum, and uh, moderating the chat at the same time. So. Uh, I, I don't I uh, don't envy her, but I admire her the the, the way that she uh, manages the webinars. At any rate, hi everybody. Um, uh, James Galapagos Grossklag here from College of the Canyons. I want to share with you a little bit about what we're doing at College of the Canyons. Uh, the first image that you see here uh, is used uh, at College of the Canyons to uh, promote our open education initiative on campus, and I I hope that a couple of things strike you uh, right away about it. First of all. Um, it's student facing. The, the audience is students. So this is communicating to students what the benefit of OER can be to them. Uh, secondly, I hope that the messages are succinct uh, and direct. Uh, their messages are saving money, accessing content immediately, and having customized content for your class. I think they're messages that you'll see uh, or have heard in other in other venues when we talk about uh, students uh, saving money and, and accessing content and uh, faculty control of content. Um, but, uh, uh, pardon me, Mary Lou, I've lost these slides. I see that, sorry about that. Wow, oh, that's okay. But I will keep on going here. Uh, we have the audio still. So uh, the, the ability for faculty to customize the content is important, is an important part of our, our messaging as well. Uh, it's something that, that you don't see about this message uh, that I'm, I'm thrilled to share is that that the uh, that the image and the and the, the banner here the slide was designed by one of our uh, part-time staff members who is a student at College of the Canyons. So uh, it it reminds me and it reminds our OER team at College of the Canyons, and I hope it reminds our colleagues at, at, at College of the Canyons that we have a strong student involvement in our initiative. 
Uh, and so what, what is our initiative add up to? Mary Lou, if you could go to the next slide, that would be great. Um, at College of the Canyons in, in the uh, spring 2017 semester, we had 40 courses, uh, distinct courses, uh, using OER in lieu of commercial textbooks. That adds up to over 200 sections, 200 individual class sections uh, using OER in lieu of commercial textbooks. And that's just around 12% of our total credit offerings uh, during the spring semester. And, and that's doubled over the past year, which is just, just tremendous. Uh, we're also quickly closing in on completing two pathways uh, through which students, that, that students can complete. Uh, using only OER uh, in lieu of commercial textbooks. Uh, one pathway is a traditional transfer pathway, uh, a, an associate degree uh, in sociology, uh, which would include the major courses plus the general education courses. And then the second is a um, uh, career technical education certificate of achievement in water systems technology here in hot Southern California. The water industry is very important to us. Um, overall, this year, this academic year, we believe our faculty members adopting OER will have saved our students over $3 million. So uh, we, think, we think things are going, going great, uh, really having a positive impact on the students. Um, and uh, if we can move on to the next, uh, next slide, Mary Lou, I, I want to share with you why I, I think we've gotten to this point. And, and before I, I uh, uh, walk through these these key terms here. Let me say that it's taken us quite a while to, to really get to this point. You know, I uh, we've been talking about some of us at College of Canyons have been talking about OER for eight or nine years now, and only in the past couple of years have we seen incredible growth and incredible adoptions. We've had some organic uh, adoptions over time, and some interest from some early adopters over time. Um, uh, but I, I want to stress that, it, that there were, were many, many years in which I was not communicating a clear message. I was not uh, uh, successful in, in uh, advocating for funding. I was not successful in uh, carrying the message uh, to our faculty uh, in an appropriate way. So uh, none of this happened overnight. Um, so so what, what contributes to, to, I think, is having reached a sustainable uh, sustainable level at College of the Canyons. First of all, uh, arising from uh, that uh, cat banner at the beginning, I think we've, we've figured out a, a, a clear, concise message. Students can save money, students can access content immediately, and students can have access to content that's customized for them. Uh, so again, it's a student-facing student, student -facing message, and it's a, can I hope, a, a quick, concise message. Also, uh, we've been, we, we have in the past uh, few years been very successful in advocating for funding. Uh, what's, I think, very helpful for us in the funding arena is that we have not been waiting for some magical pot of gold to appear from one funding source. Uh, through, our, through our organization at College of the Canyons, there's a great belief in the uh, power and sustainability of braided funding or woven funding. So uh, tying together different strands of funding uh, to really accomplish, pursue and accomplish your goals. So uh, we've combined external funding and internal funding uh, to reach a situation in which we really have an embarrassment of riches. Um, uh, in terms of external funding, uh, the state of California has invested in OER and we've been successful in, in, in uh, being awarded some of those. Uh, grant opportunities. Also, uh, we've the, the college has been successful in uh, applying for a federal Title V Hispanic Serving Institutions grant. Uh, a number of years ago, actually, uh, I placed uh, OER in that grant, and, and we were awarded that grant. So uh, uh, we've 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 woven or braided uh, OER into other grant opportunities uh, in California. Also, there's a big initiative, big fund, statewide funding initiative around promoting student equity. Uh, it would make sense that OER would, would help to promote student equity. Uh, also across the United States, there are a lot of uh, initiatives, statewide initiatives around uh, what's known as the College Promise or making the first two years of community, of community college or first two years of higher education free to students. It would make sense, again, that textbook costs would be an essential component of making college free for students. Uh, so. 
I, I would think that you'd, you'd all have a, a good, good, uh, good chances of success at including OER and those funding opportunities. With internal funding, uh, certainly uh, OER resonates with our foundation members and with local uh, nonprofits and uh, phil philanthropic organizations who want to help support our local residents in complete in accessing education and completing their education. Um, also, uh, in terms of uh, of providing hard copies of let's say OpenStax texts to our faculty members or ensuring that uh, uh, homegrown uh, open textbooks are available to students and to to faculty. Um, uh, our uh, internal reprographics department and our library have committed just ongoing regular regular funding uh, from their uh, ongoing budgets to uh, supporting our, our efforts. In addition, I'm, I'm extremely proud to say that our, our institution, our CEO, has, has uh, uh, seen that uh, uh, producing OER is a worthy, a worthy uh, worthwhile sabbatical project. So uh, this year our CEO uh, awarded uh, a second sabbatical uh, to a faculty member to produce OER. Uh, all of that leads us to the next point of having staff uh, to uh, help with OER work. So uh, many of those staff members are students or recent students, recent graduates, and, and we think that's that's we've found that's really been helpful uh, in uh, communicating with faculty. Uh, if if faculty members who are interested in OER are talking to their former students uh, or or people who can very legitimately uh, express the concerns of students, that that helps us uh, drive the message home. That also allows us to develop a workflow so that it's not just you know me or you know one person, one er, one advocate uh, trying to do all the work, but we've been able to develop a, and distribute the workflow through different parts of the organization. Uh, all of that adds up to really a, a commitment on the part of the institution, uh, whether it's funding or staffing or the workflow and and everyone in, in the institution or many parts of the institution being involved. Uh, we also have great. Uh, extremely strong commitment from our CEO, our, our board of trustees, and, and, and executive leadership here, which uh, really uh, uh, adds up to eliminating barriers, getting people out of the way, um, if, if it's known that the, uh, the executive leadership thinks this is a, a really important initiative. Uh, and then finally, I'm, I'm very proud of our, the involvement of our students. I'm very proud of our students to begin with, but I'm particularly happy that we've been able to include them. Uh, last year, our student government adopted a, authored and adopted a resolution calling on faculty to consider uh, using OER because essentially they, they, they wrote, we're dying, you know, it's, it's, it's causing us to take on more student loans, causing us to, to choose between food and textbooks, causing us to uh, not succeed in classes, please consider OER. So that, that, that's been very helpful to us, I think. Uh, and also, uh, in terms of student involvement, we simply know, uh, we're able to know what what uh, the impact of textbook costs is on our students because we ask them. Uh, thanks to our, our terrific uh, institutional research department, uh, we're able to uh, distribute surveys and uh, convene focus groups and recruit students to participate in, in panels during our, our uh, summits and, and uh, presentations on campus so that we know what students think and what students have to say uh, about the impact of textbooks and the positive impact of OER. And uh, so all of that adds up to, we think, a, uh, a really sustainable structure uh, at College of the Canyons to keep our OER initiative going, but it didn't happen overnight. And with that, I'll turn it over to Lisa. Hey everybody, good morning to those of you out west and to those of you back east, good afternoon. I hope you're all having a wonderful Wednesday and I'm very excited to be sharing um, the work that the Maricopa Millions Project has been doing. Um, we are, um, if we can advance to the next slide, Mary Lou, please. Um, the Maricopa Community Colleges are 10 separately accredited colleges, um, but we share common curriculum, um, course competencies, um, our courses articulate and transfer. So when we look at the Maricopa Millions project, this was a district-wide project that 
really began in the spring of um, 2013 when our, our executive vice chancellor and provost, who is our chief academic officer for the district, asked, you know, what is this OER? I, I hear, I'm hearing about it outside of the district. I know we have faculty doing it. What is it and what can we do with it? And that was really the genesis of the Maricopa Millions Project. And at that time, we reached out to those who were the pioneers of OER and had got lots of information and pulled together a proposal of what became the Maricopa Millions Project. And so if we can go on to the next slide, please. Um, our goal when we started was to save students $5 million in five years. And so starting the fall of 2013, we started um, looking at that. And with our project, we look at both um, no cost and low cost materials. And um, we can go on to the next slide really quickly there, please. Um, and so with our terminology of no cost and low cost, one of the things that we found through focus groups early on was that students didn't really know what OER was and that they didn't at that point, we were, weren't really looking at open pedagogy and such, and so it really didn't make a big impact on them whether we called it OER or what have you, but by labeling it no cost and low cost, um, being less than or equal to $40, we were able to provide a way that students could find those materials. And so with that, um, it can include copywritten um, materials materials in regard to um, our no cost, low cost um, terminology. However, the Maricopa Millions Project is really about supporting OER. And we've done that through OER grants. We've supported the development of 21 high enrollment courses. And um, outside of the Maricopa Millions, a math within our district, had, because they were early adopters, have um, really gone gangbusters with um, Math OER, we leverage Math AS, and they really have done a great deal of work in um, some departments are entirely OER within our district in regard to math. Um, we've really focused on faculty awareness and professional growth, and, um, and student awareness, James, I have to tell you that we have reused and remixed your students' work. Uh, um, with the OER Are You Kidding Me campaign, and we used that during Open Ed Week um, to, to really start looking at raising awareness for our students, and so the great work that you all have done and that your student did is living on in Maricopa as well um, in regard to the concept. And um, we also did some other things in regard to student awareness, um, putting together um, a search option so that students could search our schedule, and through our um, OER enhancement fee, which was supported by our board for those um, tools that around OER um, and so we're able to put this OER enhancement fee on individual sections that are using those tools, um, things that have um, personalized learning associated with them, um, early alert systems, homework systems and such that wrap around those OER that are also OER open. And um, so to date, um, you can see that um, at the end of our fourth year, we're embarking on our fifth year, um, we've saved our students um, nine, just over $9 million. And so we know that when we hit um, the fall semester, we'll, be, we'll have doubled our goal of $5 million in five years in just the beginning of our fifth year. Um, what's really been, I think, most effective in regard to our sustainability is consistency and commitment. We've had consistent messaging, consistent events, con consistent um, grants. Our faculty awareness um, have all been very consistent from the first semester because we had a really sound strategic plan for and proposal for implementing this. Um, and the commitments from our faculty, from our district and college leadership, our IT departments, and our OER steering team have really provided the ability for us to sustain this movement, as well as the assistant provide, assistance provided through our, um, our centers for learning, whether it's our centers for teaching and learning, our district-focused Maricopa Center for Learning and Instruction, um, our libraries, um, all of those organizations have really helped support it and helped bring life and integrate 
OER and the Maricopa Millions Project into what they do. So as James had mentioned, it doesn't just live in one place. It's really spread throughout the organization and that really helps with the sustainability piece. Now our project was $5 million in five years, so it was a five-year commitment. So what we're doing in this last year is really looking at how do we institutionalize everything that we've been doing um, so that this will live on beyond that five-year commitment. And so it's really exciting to be talking about this because we're really looking at moving this to, um, you know, really taking it, it's been a sustainable program, but really making sure that this is something that never leaves. And that's what we're doing at Maricopa. Great. Lisa, this is James. Let, let me ask you, can I uh, pose a couple of questions about uh, some aspects that have, have long inspired me about what you're doing in Maricopa? And the first is your, your district-wide governance. Uh, it seems as though you, you, you've succeeded in getting all the right players involved and, and, and it's somehow integrated into your regular governance structure there. Can you talk more about that? Absolutely. So um, we have our OER steering team and that was really an essential piece of making this successful. And so with that, we put the steering team together with the support of the chief academic officer. And so they are our executive sponsor and we meet with, um, this. The, the person has changed, but we meet with the person in that office regularly, um, sometimes monthly, sometimes quarterly based on schedules, but the tri-chairs of the Maricopa Millions Project meet with them and make sure that they're aware of everything that we're doing and we can find out about any initiatives and ways that we can combine our efforts. Um, and so that's really a very strong piece that we have the leadership, but also what's very strong in that is the faculty involvement. So our OER steering team has our executive sponsor as our chief academic officer. We have a president who attends the meet, one of our 10 college presidents attends the meeting things and is an active participant. We have a vice president of academic affairs and we have a dean of instruction um, within the OER steering team and their, their roles are really to take it back to their peer, whatever's happening in that OER steering team and take it back to their peers so that all of the college's leadership is aware of what's going on with OER. But what's also really special about this group is that we went out and we, we want representation from each of the colleges. And so we have seeked out, but we don't want too big a, commi a committee. So our com committee right now is about 17 people. When it's full, um, it's about 20 to 22 people. Um, we have a couple colleges missing, but we do want representation from each college. We want representation from various disciplines um, for faculty on various disciplines. And then we also have representation from instructional designers, CTL directors, library, library faculty, and IT personnel. So that when we have questions or we have an opportunity come arise, we have the people in that room are all really able to help us come up with how can we take advantage of this opportunity that's, that's arisen, or how do we make this great idea happen like with our um, our SIS search that was something that the committee was able to really help us with and the other piece that I think is really important regarding this is that we um, that representation and those different faculty aren't necessarily people who have drank the Kool-Aid and that's really important too. We didn't want just people who were like, yes, OER. We wanted some people who were like, well, I'm interested in this, but I don't know if this is right for me or my discipline or for the faculty at my college or in my department. And so we made sure that we have a representation that is um, really looking at representing all of our faculty. And then, of course, we do have someone from our faculty association, our FEC, um, who's like our uh, equivalent, I guess, to a faculty union um, serving on that committee, too. And that was something we had missed initially. And um, we made sure we had later, as sometimes um, issues arose that we needed that their involvement in. Th thanks, Lisa. That's, that, that's very helpful. I hope it's helpful for our, for our audience. When the key piece that I'm extracting from that is that 
regardless of the individuals in particular offices, you have the offices represented or you have the, the roles represented. So there's a liaison and communication function occurring across offices. Is that accurate? That is very accurate, yes. Great. Okay. Thank you. And then you, you mentioned the uh, SIS search feature or, or schedule uh, s search feature uh, about OER, low-cost uh, uh, options. Uh, in California, uh, that piece of, uh, let's say, sustainability is being uh, implemented by uh, legislation, really. Um, beginning in January of 2018, uh, by law, all of our state universities and community colleges will be required to place in their schedule of classes a unique identifier for uh, sections that provide students with zero textbook cost options, and that's, again, by legislation. But you, you did this long ago. Could you talk about how you uh, came to that realization that, that that would help students and, and how you got it in place? Absolutely. Um, so we did put together an SIS filter, and um, it was quite an ordeal because it's, you know it, 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 it encompassed a lot of um, programming and liaising with our IT department at our district level. Um, but it was something that the OER steering team felt was really important, and it came about because um, we did focus groups with students, and we found that students were taking a great deal of time data mining planning their ske the schedule because students within the district, even though we're 10 separately accredited colleges, as I mentioned, they have a common curriculum. So students can take English 101 at any of those 10 colleges and, um, and it will work towards their degree. And we call those swirling students. So what we um, found was that the students were spending hours data mining the schedule, searching to see how much the mater materials cost before enrolling. And we thought, wow, if students could put that kind of energy into studying, imagine the impact. Um, so we polled students and we asked them what is low cost and they came up with the value of $40 and so we thought they'd come in lower but the polls um, showed that they felt that $40 was a reasonable amount of, time, of money to pay for their, co their course materials and um, we had this, um, there, there's a code that goes into our student information system that our schedulers put in and now it's just part of the process. So when faculty do their book adoptions, they'll indicate whether it's under $40. If it is, then our schedulers code it, and that automatically allows in our search function within the schedule students to be able to search for those no cost or low cost less than $40 materials. And it puts a note in the course saying that the, these materials are um, either no cost or less than $40 and may contain open educational resources. Um, and so initially what happened was that search function was very, very prominently um, placed on the search for the students. And that's when we um, first heard from our faculty association and got the idea to add someone from there because um, faculty had complained that it was too prominent and why isn't it where you know students can pick different options for their classes as opposed to being the main thing. And so it did get moved into a more appropriate place um, for the students and they are able to um, search. And now what's really exciting also with the search function is that I've been working with the IT department and again, that's part of that OER steering team and having the right people um, to be able to liaise with. Um, we've made a, developed a program that will then take that code and help me calculate the cost savings. So initially what would happen is um, we calculate our cost savings and I saw that as a question in the, bo um, in the question box that um, what, at 2013 we took the top 50 high enrollment courses and we then would search through the schedule at all 10 colleges for those courses that were using the no cost low cost filter and adding it all up and coming up with the cost savings. So it took about 40 hours to um, data mine that information. Um, now it takes about 15 minutes because that um, program will automatically do it for 
all of the colleges collectively as well as individually and provide me with that information. And so we only use our top 50 high enrollment courses and we um, calculate $100 per textbook. Um, that's kind of a national norm. There's a few um, institutions that use a, something different, but for the most part, um, colleges are using $100 to calculate that. And so we don't use every course that comes up as low cost, no cost. We are only using those top 50 high enrollment courses that from 2013 so that the longitudinal data is consistent. Yeah, I'm glad you, I'm glad you picked up on that question from Doreen and, and, and addressed it. And, and yeah, the, the $100 certainly is the national norm. I, 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 I am just grateful for the $100 as the norm because my degrees are in humanities and I can't do complicated math. But uh, also I, I, I would say that uh, uh, one of the things to be aware of is that, that I, I am finding is that with um, external requirements such as legislative requirements or uh, a variety of external funding, uh, for example, through our braided approach to funding, come different uh, different requirements for data, different metrics, right? So uh, some of our funders are content with us identifying the, or using the, the national standard of $100 uh, as, as the cost savings, but others want actual cost savings. So requiring us to go back to document the or original retail cost of the textbooks and compare that to what it is now. So uh, it, it can get complicated if you do if you are successful in uh, in uh, securing a variety of funding sources. So just a, a word of caution there. You sometimes you're you get more than you bargain for. Absolutely, James, and I'm glad that you shared that. And I did want to ask you about um, having funding because, um, as you may know, the community college budget for the Maricopa Community Colleges has gone from $68 million to zero dollars from our state. And so we're in a situation situation where we don't have a lot of, we don't even have the funding that we used to have, forget about um, external funding to fund this. So can you tell me a little bit about some of the ways that you are getting these funds as well as um, yeah, the, some of the cautions perhaps that you, as you've shared and some of the ways that you're really working to make that a priority? Sure. Uh, boy, there, there are a number of different levels. First of all, uh, in California, the state of California, we've been very fortunate that uh, we that the OER movement has has friends in high places. Let's say so uh, through the efforts of uh, T.J. Bliss at the Hewlett Foundation and Hal Plotkin with Creative Commons, and formerly with the U.S. Department of Education, and formerly uh, with a California Community College, uh, uh, the movement was able to advocate successfully uh, in our state capital. Uh, for the state, for the governor and the legislature to uh, invest specifically in open educational resources and more specifically in uh, promoting uh, ZTC uh, degrees. So that's, uh, that's certainly uh, unique to, to our setting in California, but, but what's not unique about that is that the advocacy was able to frame the case for OER as supporting larger interests of the governor and the legislature, namely increasing not only access to higher education, but the completion. Uh, nationally, I think most of us on the, on, on the call here would, uh, would know that uh, nationally there's a move uh, uh, away from being only concerned about access to higher education and also concerned about completion. Uh, so uh, friends like John Hilton and David Wiley have documented uh, that uh, the throughput, if you will, the uh, completion of students in OER classes is greater than that of students taking non-OER classes or taking classes with commercial textbooks. So uh, it's been, I think it's very helpful to understand what the uh, larger priorities are uh, within the funding circles, whether that's private foundations or uh, federal grants or state grants or the state legislature, and uh, attempting to frame your particular interest, your particular passion, uh, in a way that aligns with or supports the, the larger goals uh, of the people who hold the purse strings. In addition, if you think about um, 
federal grants, at least under the previous administration, uh, federal grants under the Department of Education were, uh, and the Department of Labor, uh, were providing uh, some uh, uh, additional points for uh, projects that uh, included uh, open. Uh, and the U.S. Department of Education recently announced uh, uh, the adoption of, uh, or I, I suppose it would be the acceptance of rulemaking that uh, calls for uh, discretionary federal grants uh, to be open, uh, the result of fed, uh, discretionary federal grants to be openly licensed. So uh, we'll hope that uh, there will continue to be um, some preference for projects that uh, explicitly call out the open nature of their of their uh, outputs. Um, in addition, uh, I would say that there's tremendous opportunity in the College Promise uh, movements all across the United States. Uh, again, uh, I think any, anybody who follows, follows the national discussions uh, knows that simply uh, removing uh, the tuition costs is not going to really help the, the co National College Promise movement achieve its goals. So, uh, it's a great opportunity for all of us in the open movement to to get involved with sort of the, the next big trend in in open or in in community college education. Uh, in addition, at the local level, uh, many many colleges have foundations. Many colleges have uh, have uh, ties to local local nonprofits or philanthropic organizations, and uh, um, you know it's it's I think it's an easy case to make locally that. Uh, your community college uh, is producing, helping to produce, if you will, produce uh, uh, graduates who are going to be uh, contributing to the local economy and, uh, and uh, become valuable employees, and they're more likely to, uh, to, to, to graduate and be available to work if, if textbook costs are not an issue. Um, in addition, I think that, you know, in the case of, of, of Arizona, where you don't have a state funding, uh, I, I would suggest that uh, uh, you have a competitive advantage if you're able to eliminate textbook costs. Um, you know, College X costs this, College Y costs the same, but College Z costs the same minus the textbook cost. So it's it's certainly a way to uh, present yourself as a, as having a competitive advantage, and that's something that resonates with uh, bean counting uh, administrators like myself. Um, Absolutely, James. And um, one of the other things that I've found, especially with trying to get funding, is trying to weave OER into the grants that we're applying for as an institution, um, as well as some of our internal grants outside of the Maricopa Millions. And so we're always trying to leverage that as part of the product of the grants. And I, I think that's something that you're doing also. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for, for phrasing it more succinctly than I did. Absolutely. Yeah, so, so it's a, yeah, it's also a matter of, of, of being a part of the team at the college, or being be having your ear to the ground, or perhaps through through your uh, district wide steering committee, knowing what grants are on the radar, and and making sure that uh, as a a grants writing team in student services or institutional research or IT gets underway, that you're able to poke your head in the door and say, hey, don't forget about open, include open in there. <laughs> Absolutely. And then I have another question for you, James. Um, so, and, and this is something that Jim has just um, noted too, and so this is a question that I have for you. We, you know, we've, we both, you know, have seen a lot of the data that David Wiley and John Hilton and others have done in looking at the impact that using OER is having on student success and completion, whether it's looking at them being able to take more courses and more credits because they have more funding available because they're not paying for textbooks, as well as um, we're seeing improvements in student success from a customized um, for, from customized course materials. Um, I'd be interested to know what kind of data collection efforts you all are doing um, at, at your institution um, in regard to student data collection and um, because that's something that we're really trying to get more into um, in this current year and I'm sure our audience is curious too. Yeah, so far, thanks for that question, Lisa and, and, uh, and Jim. I, so far, uh, much of our data collection with students has focused on uh, the impact, the sort of implied negative impact of commercial textbook costs. So we know through our um, standard institutional student survey that when we ask 
when we ask students what's the greatest barrier to you achieving your in your educational goals uh, the greatest number of responses come in that the greatest barrier is uh, the cost of textbooks and supplies it's not work and family pressures it's not the cost of tuition but rather uh, textbooks and textbooks and supplies so having that kind of data is helpful in advocating with uh, our faculty and advocating with funders I think uh, in addition, we've asked students through specific surveys relevant to re relating to textbook costs, um, asked our students how many of you, uh, due to the cost of textbooks, are more likely to change your enrollment patterns or select a different class or um, not purchase a textbook. How many of you are worried that because you don't purchase a textbook, it will impact your negatively impact your grade? So really mirroring the data that we've seen and the questions that we've seen from the Florida textbook survey and uh, by Robin Donaldson, um, and uh, mirroring the data that we've seen from uh, the student perns um, uh, that came out in the study, fixing a broken textbook market. So we tried to replicate that locally. Uh, what we have on the positive outcome side from students so far uh, is uh, the students who are satisfied or very satisfied with the quality of the OER that they've been using. Uh, that, not, that percentage is 76% of, of students who are in classes using OER are satisfied or very satisfied with the quality of OER in their classes. So we, as we continue um, with our, with our initiative and, and continue to institutionalize the initiative, absolutely a crucial piece will be making the connection to increased uh, uh, student success and student retention. We haven't gotten there yet, but that is definitely on our radar, and I think that's that's something that we should all be doing. I, I agree 100 percent and I know one of the things that we're doing at Maricopa and is actually on my to-do list for this summer is that I'm going to be taking a look at the OER Research Hub and looking at um, some of the studies that have been done specifically looking at student success, student grades, um, persistence and such, um, and student success metrics, and looking at what that it would take to replicate some of those studies at the Maricopa Community Colleges. And so that's something that we're definitely going to be putting in place for the fall and getting that through IRB this summer. So I'm really, we, we've done a lot of the surveys um, to, to gather student satisfaction um, and more of the qualitative data, uh, but we're really going to look at getting into um, the quantitative data, and so we're really looking forward to embarking on that. Um, interestingly, it's something that I propose to our steering team every year, and I don't think we have a lot of people who are really into research, and so finally I was like, I'm just going to do it because I think it'll be fun. So we're going to end. I think it'll be really meaningful um, and Wait, give us some really good data. Yeah, and speaking of something we should all be doing, uh, Kayla Parks asks a, a very good question, uh, whether we can speak to the ways in which accessibility or disability uh, comes into play uh, within efforts to support sustainable, equitable, and student-centered OER use. That's a great question. Um, we um, require that the materials that are created through the Maricopa Millions Grants um, are accessible and um, and that, and we, we try to help the faculty with universal design um, as they're developing. Um, but we don't, and, and I know that we've been partnering actually with you all, James, in um, helping get some of our math videos um, tra transcribed or closed <coughs> captioned. Yeah. Um, but I think you're a lot further on in your efforts than we are. Well, so well, I think that you'd be able to share a lot. Yeah, I think I think in, in California community colleges, we're just we're fortunate that we have a number of statewide uh, state-funded accessibility support services. Um, but I, I would observe that uh, nationally, many of the folks who are involved in OER come out of distance learning or come out of uh, centers for teaching and learning. Uh, and in in both of those realms, my my observation is that that there's a great commitment to accessibility and that uh, alt tags and styles and uh, uh, proper tagging of PDFs and captioning of videos, that, that's just part of the normal workflow in producing content for uh, a, an online class or it's part of our universal design is part of the uh, training menu that the Center for Teaching and Learning offers, I would hope. Um, at least that's, that's what we're 
that's what we're we're trying to try to, to 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 model here at College of the Canyons. Um, so so Kyla, I I I kind of put it you know turn the question back to say uh, I don't know why uh, producing content around that's openly licensed would be uh, any different than producing any other content uh, out of a college other than uh, having an open license makes it much, much easier and, and legal to uh, add the alt tags and to add the captions and so on. Um, so I, I, I don't mean to, 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 uh, to you know, to, to not respond to your question, but I think it's, it's really a question that, that um, I hope is addressed anyways. Absolutely. And I, I think that if that's something that you are, that you're struggling with or that that's something new for your institution, um, BC Open Campus has a great accessibility toolkit that um, is a fantastic resource um, for OER that can provide you with some guidance there. Yeah, and, and, and part of it's also just uh, making sure that the content that you're involved in producing or adopting at your institution is subject again subject to the regular uh, vetting that we hope any content is subject to, right? As as, as Lisa suggested, of course, if it, if it's new to your institution, that that can be tricky. And and Kelsey Smith asks whether uh, we have a, a a specific staff member who's responsible for checking. Well, the, at College of Canyons, our, our our answer is is kind of yes and no. Um, uh, the workflow of College of the Canyons is that. Uh, uh, faculty members who are teaching online are required to uh, complete a complete some training before they teach online. That training includes uh, accessibility. Uh, we have a dedicated accessibility coordinator who works in our disability services office who provides training to faculty uh, uh, on uh, making their content accessible and is available as a resource for students who want to receive a, a braille, braille version of their textbooks, for example. Uh, so the, let's say, the, the standard, regular, existing uh, processes of an institution would apply. In addition, the uh, student workers or college assistants we have on our OER team uh, are trained in accessibility, uh, so they can put all tags on content. They can check that things are formatted using styles, and if they're not, they'll, they'll format it using styles, and so on and so forth. And um, I might add, we've had a couple questions about, um, and there was one that we, we missed earlier, James, kind of about vetting OER, and, and now we have this vetting accessibility. And I think that um, there's a number of ways to do that, and with our America for Millions project, we have a peer review process at the end of the grant process. So our grants, um, the faculty get, um, funded for three semesters, that includes a semester for training, a an, um, semester for development of their OER materials, which, um, as I say development, it's really using those five R's to make sure that, um, you know, reusing, remixing, um, what have you, um, and creating any materials, and of course making those OER. And the third semester, they pilot it. After the pilot process, um, they make revisions, and then we have a peer review process, and this peer review process is important for a couple of reasons. One is it gives um, feedback to the, the team developing the OER to um, so that they can get feedback on the OER materials, um, how it aligns with course competencies and such, and, and of course accessibility. Um, but it also is an opportunity for us to get those materials into the hands of other faculty who may be willing and interested in adopting those materials. And so the peer review process really um, serves two options. Right now we're using the achieve rubric, um, but we're going to be making some, um, we're going to work on adapting that um, because we found that um, faculty who are doing the reviews, each faculty has a different reason for wanting to do the reviews and sometimes they're looking more at the content quality as opposed to the OER and so we're looking at doing something a little more comprehensive. James, do you do anything like that? We don't and we should. Well, you know what? I, I said that too quickly. We don't, and I'm not sure that we should. I, you know, I see that popping up uh, at different institutions, and part of you know part part of me thinks we should because we see other institutions doing it, right? And because we get, because 
we hear from faculty all the time, gosh, peer review is so important, or, or they think peer review is important. But on the other hand, you know, I'm not sure about the role of our OER team in getting too deep into the content. We really, uh, in our OER team, we really view ourselves as the facilitators and enablers. And once the content, once the faculty are satisfied with the content, we really step back. If they want, if they want edits or they want to uh, have our help making sure that hard copies are available for their students and so on and so forth, we'll, we're, we're happy to jump in there. But the conversations that faculty have within their departments about the content, really we like to leave up to the faculty, if that makes sense. Absolutely. So I'm kind of torn in my answer. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it's interesting because is we, we have we, we often in our OER steering team um, have these conversations and one of the things that we've been really um, working with is we share the Maricopa Millions courses through our Maricopa Millions website but we're going to be moving that to Canvas Commons and we had a lot of discussions about you know do we have to do a huge review and make sure that you know for the OER materials and you know we need to make sure that what they're sharing with everyone is legally able to and what if they have something copywritten in their OER course that we didn't know about um, but we really decided to take the approach um, on that in regard basically through training and so in order for the faculty to do that we basically have them go through a training course that provides them with information on the Canvas Commons repository and on really what it means that they're moving their materials to that because we want to have all of the OER materials moved to that with special tagging and this allows us to really let them know this is what you're saying if you're putting it in Canvas Commons and tagging it with the OER metadata and this is what it means legally and mm -hmm. I, we think that's enough in that respect yeah it's it's a it's a it's a tricky question I think you know the extent to which yeah you you, you, you provide the training and let people do their thing uh, particularly you know our faculty colleagues or how much do you want to get involved in in the content I'm not, I'm not quite sure about that yeah, yeah. it's a tricky one yeah. And, and I'm looking I'm looking at the time Mary Lou do we want to uh, do we have time for one more question or do you, you want to move on to the uh, uh, concluding remarks here yep no I think we have time for one more question and we've got about six minutes left so is there a final question someone would like to ask the panelists or an observation another suggestion that we haven't haven't uh, mentioned we certainly don't have all the answers we have a perhaps a couple of years more experience but we certainly don't have all the answers absolutely All right, well, maybe I can ask you one question for each of you. Um, could you talk about what was your biggest challenge in getting your project to be sustainable at your institution? Um, I can go for that one. I think that um, our biggest challenge is that we're, we're trying to move forward with the Z degree or OER degree, and we um, that's a huge, huge undertaking. Um, and that by doing it, I think it'll make it even more sustainable. But it's been really challenging trying to match up the courses that are desired by students that are definitely um, advantageous for them to have for like for example a transfer degree and then finding the faculty who are interested in teaching and, and moving to OER um, it's, it's kind of logistically huge and so um, we have four colleges that are working towards moving to that and that has been the biggest challenge everything else has come we've been really fortunate that it's been fairly easy and and has made become very sustainable but that OER degree has definitely um, been a challenge yeah I, I would say the biggest uh, problem or, or mistake that, that, that I made is is staying in my box and, and not um, trying to integrate my interest in OER into the rest of the institution and and not uh, really understanding what students and, and most faculty want. Um, I, I talked for years about learning objects and, and the OER playlists and thinking that uh, um, we would uh, uh, be pulling together courses or courseware the same way that people put together playlists on iTunes and 
And while I was talking about that, faculty and students were busy adopting and creating open textbooks. So I, I completely missed the, uh, the power of, uh, that, that open textbooks would have. And uh, now that I've understood that, I think we're, we're making a lot more uh, progress and having a lot more, more positive response from faculty and students. Great. Thanks very much uh, for all of your comments and for um, a really great conversation there with a lot of um, wonderful questions from the audience. So just in closing, we wanted to let you know what is coming up and how you can stay involved. Um, the upcoming conferences, there will be uh, the Open Ed 2017 conference is happening in October in Anaheim. And CCCOER will be giving some presentations and, of course, a lot of you will be will be there. If you haven't yet decided to come, please check out that website and see all of the exciting and interesting presentations that they'll have because it's a wonderful professional development opportunity for you and your colleagues. You can also look at the cccoer.org website and go under the Get Involved tab to see uh, how you can join the community email list. You can see the webinars that will resume in the fall, and you can see other, uh, other avenues for you to get involved with the greater CCCOER community. So we welcome you to continue to be in touch with us uh, over the next couple of months. Um, we have already had time for questions, so we just really wanted to thank you at this point for joining us today. If you do have any further follow-up that you'd like to ask either of our presenters or Una, here are their email uh, addresses that are on the screen right now. We also will archive this presentation and have it available on the CCCOER website in about two weeks. Um, and we also wanted just to bring to your attention quickly that this afternoon, right after this, is going to be uh, another webinar, uh, which will take place on, on the GoToMeeting platform. I'll paste the link right there in the chat window. Uh, if you'd like to join us, it's on open policy, and there'll be several people from around the world who will talk about the benefits of open policy and helping get open educational resources integrated into uh, the common way of doing things. This is part of the Year of Open initiative, which I hope you're all aware of. 2017 is the Year of Open, and we're trying to raise awareness, increase collaboration, and come out with some great partnerships uh, among people working to see openness as part of our everyday world. So thanks again to everybody. We hope to see you in the webinar series in the fall, and please be in touch. Thank you very much to Lisa and to, uh, and to James. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.